Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod and patronize me. Now I am, if you've been following the last few weeks, done with the big project at work. Um, it's kind of enormous. I can't go into details about it for a variety of reasons, but it is thankfully over and done. There will be a lot of follow-up stuff that needs doing, but the big stuff is done. Um, I do finally have a little time to breathe um, before the fall trade show season starts, but uh, this whole summer has been sort of a bunch of lost opportunities for me because of the project. Uh, I missed a bunch of trips I was going to make, a bunch of uh, episodes I was going to record, so I have sort of been scrambling the last few weeks to make sure I had a show ready for you guys. Um, this time around, I had nothing and put out a blag on Facebook. Uh, so my pal Alana suggested this week's guest. Um, that turned out to be really fortuitous because, A, he didn't have a book out that I needed to read. Uh, and B, he really fits in with last week's episode, the one that featured Virginia Heffernan, uh, the author of um, Magic and Loss, The Internet is Art. Um, so our guest this time is Jeff Gomez. He's the CEO of a company called Starlight Runner Entertainment, uh, and they produce transmedia, which Jeff will explain when the conversation begins much better than I can explain it here. Um, the upside for you guys is where the conversation with Virginia Heffernan was about the ways in which um, in which the internet is a massive piece of performance art. Uh, Jeff kind of extends on that into a real world scenario in which the well in which the new modes of storytelling that are being engendered uh through the internet um and that his company helps facilitate how they sort of fit into the history of storytelling overall and how things may not be quite the um the jump away from from all things in the past that we think it is uh so he's got a very thoughtful guy very interesting stuff about storytelling and the demands of the internet on story, um, as well as just the demands of our culture in general about this stuff. So anyway, it turned out to be lucky. That's what I'm saying. Now, here's Jeff's bio. Jeff Gomez is CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment and has the greatest job in the universe. He designs, expands, and defends the integrity of some of the biggest blockbuster worlds in all of pop culture. Jeff served as a creator for the story worlds of Magic the Gathering, Turok Dinosaur Hunter N64, Hot Wheels World Race, and Coca-Cola Happiness Factory. As the most renowned transmedia producer in the entertainment industry, Jeff takes blockbuster movies, hit video games, and major toy brands, and develops and extends their fictional worlds across multiple media platforms. He also serves as an advisor and consultant on global trends in technology, youth culture, and social media to studio heads, publishers, licensing agencies, C-suite executives, and government leaders. Jeff has worked on such franchises as Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, James Cameron's Avatar, Hasbro's Transformers, Sony Pictures' Spider-Man, 343 Studios' Halo, and Nickelodeon's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He also teaches transmedia storytelling for social good to nonprofits, educational institutions, and non governmental organizations across the globe, including Mexico, Colombia, Australia, and the Middle East and North Africa region. Growing up on the rough streets of New York City, Jeff has always championed the causes of young people. His Never Surrender seminars teach kids how to deal with bullies, and he regularly provides career counseling to imaginative teens and young adults who are facing challenges in life. We didn't get into that last part, uh, the social good 
of of what Jeff does. Um, and we really hit it off in a fun way in this conversation. So I'm sort of hoping we'll be able to get together in a few months to do a follow up that's less about the well, less about exploring transmedia and more about uh, some of the good stuff that can come out of it. And now the virtual memories conversation with Jeff Gomez. So give me the short version of what transmedia storytelling is. I know you've given a bazillion speeches and, and pitches on it, but um, for the audience, what's the, the elevator pitch? Well, um, uh, about uh, uh, 15, 17 years ago, I, I began to realize that young people were receiving story in a very different way <laughs> than, uh, uh, than previous generations. They were using the internet. They were talking about um, uh, the uh, the stories they liked, movies, television shows, novels, um, through the internet, and um, and kind of adding to um, uh, this this body of knowledge about story, and um, and they were also able to reach out directly to the authors of those stories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, pretty soon, television producers were reaching out to fans through the internet and dialoguing with them, and that dialogue was impacting the story of a, a show like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, I realized that um, uh, as as the money uh, being paid for story was was growing, it's becoming more and more expensive, and um, and as um, uh, the studios uh, and, and owners of story had a need to extend it and make it last longer. Um, that wasn't going to happen if you just repeat the story on one medium after another after mm -hmm. another. So transmedia storytelling is a way of telling stories uh, using different media platforms in such a way that different parts of the story unfold on different media. Um, so it's uh, if you have a message, if you have a, a theme, if you have a storyline, and um, and you are um, communicating it uh, across uh, different media in concert, so that the audience can receive the story and collect the story, um, uh, you will immerse the audience and make a connection um, that is more powerful than conventional linear storytelling it seems that there would be a um a tough middle road to strike between um this is simply you know cross marketing or this involving so many elements you almost lose the core audience that you know if there are so many different ways for them to find the story they they kind of if anybody's missing any parts of it they don't get what's going on in sort of the main property how do you try to to work at that balance or am I looking at it in the really, oh, really no, you're, incorrect you're, way? Oh, no, that's one of the big challenges. Mm -hmm. So, so um, there are techniques to, to doing good transmedia storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, each piece of story, at least for the time being, needs to kind of have a beginning, middle, and end, uh, needs to be enjoyable in its own right, um, and, um, and needs to add to our sense of the overall story world. Um, uh, so... Um, you, you can enjoy it and get out, um, or, or you can uh, enjoy it and want more and pursue it. And with new technology, it's easy to find kind of the next piece of story. Mm -hmm. yeah, can you go into some illustrations of that or examples? Well, um, uh, everyone talks about Star Wars. Um, in, in, um, in recent years, um, uh, Star Wars was acquired by uh, the Disney Company, and the Disney Company uses transmedia storytelling extremely effectively. So you can go to the movies and see uh, the, the big new Star Wars film. Um, and if you go home uh, on Saturday morning, you can watch the Star Wars animated series and actually learn something new about this universe, um, about something that happened before the movies or something that anticipates what's going to happen in the movies. And you get some joy out of saying, oh, I, this is a piece of the puzzle. I see how it fits into this grander narrative. You could also purchase a Star Wars comic and find out something new about Han Solo 
Um, that's official. That's kind of real. In the old days, you used to be able to license your intellectual property, and your licensee could do anything they want with it. That's why when I was a kid and read Planet of the Apes comic books, there were dinosaurs on the, <laughs> uh, 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 on the world of the Planet of the Apes. And if you were reading the Star Wars comic, as I was, you had the, uh, the big green bunny Everybody also. complains <laughs> about Jackson. <laughs> but, um, uh, but those were not canonical, as we nerds put it. Mm -hmm. um, th that wasn't a real story because the licensee was not obliged to add something new um, uh, that was a part of the official uh, story of the universe. And um, uh, that used to be fine. But today... Yeah, when did that change? That, um, that need to you know, fit into canonical... <laughs> canon yeah. um yes not just um, for star wars but I'm, when, when do you think that really shifted that people wanted official reality sure sure um the um um the in the uh in the 80s and 90s um the uh the marvel and dc comics um uh became very popular again so they were selling millions of of copies of these comic books and they had a kind of continuity amongst themselves so if you read uh, Spider-Man and Spider-Man sneezed, <laughs> um, uh, you could read Daredevil and Dare Daredevil would say Gesundheit. <laughs> you know, it, it, they, they, they were connected to each other. And, um, and, and these, uh, uh, these kids loved that stuff. And, and who, what did they grow up into? Movie executives mm. <laughs> and television show producers and, and so forth. Uh, the, the nerds of the world are finally uh, are running at least the entertainment uh, yeah. uh, industry. So, um, uh, so there was that. But then there was also the Internet because um, uh, with the advent of stuff like Harry Potter, uh, everybody could, could discuss how um, uh, uh, these tiny details in the story connected with other tiny details in the sequels, uh, sequel novels, and, and so forth. So seriality, the, the, the notion that stories were ongoing, um, uh, uh, promoted a kind of fan loyalty and fan discussion that um, uh, had the more ardent fans protective of canon. Mm. Um, uh, so um, uh, uh, this became uh, really kind of uh, supercharged with the advent of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where um, uh, Kevin Feige, the producer of these Marvel movies, uh, cared about canon. And, um, and so he began to plant Easter eggs in that first Iron Man, Iron Man movie that uh, would manifest into other movies. You'd, you'd see all these connections. He then allowed for the creation of a television show that dovetailed with the events of the Marvel movies. And then he, he created Netflix uh, uh, shows that um, dovetailed with the network shows and the Marvel movies. It was kind of amazing. It was this kind of uh, cosmology unfolding in front of us that, that, um, that made us really enjoy it. And the reason we enjoy these kind of finely tooled story worlds is because we love dollhouses. We, we love miniatures. We love to see um, uh, 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 universes, stories that are created in such a way that they convince us somehow, even for a moment, that they're real. See, I thought with the dollhouse thing, you're making another Joss Whedon reference. Oh. I that <laughs> because wow. I, I, I can minor nerd. I, I'm not it major is, nerd uh, anymore. <laughs> it is rare I get to podcast with a true nerd. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I try to hide it, you know. Um, is there a degree of still falling towards that, that question of, of just too many details or too much continuity? Is there a sort of saturation point with that? I'd, I'd wondered... Because I generally, I, I was raised on superheroes, and I don't go to the the superhero movies uh, much. There seemed to be a degree of trying to cram like fifty years of continuity into like a two and a half hour movie um, with some some of the ones that didn't work well. And and agreed. Yeah, is that a a sensitivity you have, and that that the you know property owners have as you're working with them in terms of let's not throw the kitchen sink in here. Let's be selective about how we're 
putting it together? Um, as, uh, as my uh, uh, notions about transmedia storytelling and the practical applications of, of these techniques came together in the early aughts, um, uh, I had to think about um, how much detail you, you put into the, this sort of thing uh, before you overwhelmed um, uh, the, the audience. And, uh, and one of our first clients was Mattel, <laughs> a toy company um, uh, I had formed Starlight Runner. Um, uh, Mattel came to me because I had been successful in the video game world, building these these big uh, uh, story worlds, and um, um, I um, I was asked to um, to see if I could do this around the Hot Wheels uh, toy cars, and um, um, and this was a product for very young kids, so. Um, I could not jam um, a gigantic rivers of, of mythos and detail into into this content. It had to be clear and understandable. The, um, uh, uh, the, the stories became so successful that it was a real object lesson uh, uh, for us. We, we really um, uh, began to um, understand that keeping it relatively simple and leaving Easter eggs so that the fans can kind of go down the rabbit hole and and uh, and discover more about this world on the internet and in these uh, uh, fan uh, communications platforms. That was the way to go. Do you find it easier working from the ground up or with a property that has a legacy and history behind it? It's a great question, um, and I'm sure it varies by the property it, it, and your investment it does, in but it. But here's here's the thing. Um, uh, it's it's fun if it's a highly detailed established world if i'm a fan yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if i love it i get to play in one of one of the greatest sandboxes in in the world so, so in all of popular culture pirates of the caribbean halo the video game uh, uh series um uh, uh spider-man and ninja turtles those are awesome and have huge rich um mythologies that that date back um, uh, decades. Um, so it's an honor because I'm, I'm handling something, uh, kind of precious and, um, and I get to, um, uh, use my skill set with, um, with a group of people who are at the top of their game. Um, but some of the greatest moments in my career were with brand new, uh, intellectual properties. Um, working with uh, James Cameron on Avatar, um, um, having uh, Coca-Cola come to us with the Happiness Factory. So they had 60 seconds of content about these creatures inside of a Coke machine that built bottles of Coca-Cola for you yeah. after you put your coin in the machine. Um, uh, you know, what is that universe? What is, what's it about? And how can we introduce it uh, over the course of years to an entire planet. That, those were some of the most awesome uh, uh, projects I've ever been on. What form does the, uh, does the storytelling take? Because we've been talking sort of theoretically as opposed to practically, you know, beyond Easter eggs within movies or post-credit, uh, you know, sequences. How does, it, how does it work? What do you do? Um, <clears throat> Uh, I grew up in New York City, so I'm an average schmo um, who, who did not grow up in Hollywood. Um, uh, uh, you know, I didn't walk into this situation as a rich person. So why on earth would you listen to Jeff Gomez um, and, and have him advise you on your, your universe? Um, uh, there would be a, a, just a few reasons. Number one. I happen to know a whole lot about story and about uh, story structure and the history of story and how narrative works and has worked around the world um, into uh, ancient history. Um, number two, I ask a whole lot of questions. Hmm. So um, if, if I can't be a threat to these incredible visionaries, uh, they can't sit there and think, um, well, this fanboy wants to assert his narrative over my work. So what I have to do is is uh, engender uh, trust, first with the top executives of the movie studios or the big brands, and second with the true visionaries who um, uh, are, are building these, these giant um, uh, entertainment franchises. And I do that 
by asking questions um, that don't just delve into uh, character and plot, but truly uh, uh, um, uh, delve into um, uh, where the persona of the visionary, where the message, the passion um, exists that connects the visionary to the material. Because my responsibility as a transmedia storyteller is to make absolutely certain that that message remains intact as it extends across multiple media platforms. Once they understand that, they trust me because um, because they know I will fiercely uh, uh, defend and, and protect um, the intellectual property. So why didn't the Fantastic Four movies ever work? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> because the visionaries didn't ask those questions. There you go. I, I assume that was going to be the payoff. <laughs> uh, but, but how has story changed? And, and what is the the role of fandom, you know, how much has that driven the way story consumption has changed and how much does it drive the way stories are being constructed and how much flexibility do stories, there's a lot of questions in one, but how much flexibility does story have to accommodate those pressures from the, uh, from the fandom aspect and the, the, the broader audience? Um, check this out. Story existed in, in one form from the dawn of human history until just a couple of years, a hundred years ago when it was disrupted. Mm-hmm. The disruption is ending, okay? So um, uh, for thousands of years of human history, story was uh, something that was done in a face-to-face situation. <clears throat> Um, we were sitting in a circle, maybe there was a fire, uh, maybe the storyteller was someone shamanic or a nomad who went from town to town or, or a group of, uh, of, of performers. And you sat around and listened to the story, but you also participated. Um, storytellers, and it's not that well known for some reason, storytellers customized their narratives to the audience of, of, of the local audience that they, they came to visit. And um, a story was um, communal. Story was about um, uh, uh, people uh, responding to the storyteller. That all ended with the advent of uh, broadcast media. So, um, uh, you know, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, the printing press, novels, um, uh, you, you had um, then, then the 20th century radio and all that. Uh, you know, it you, reminds you had... me, uh, actually, um, when I did an interview with Cliff Nesteroff, the, uh, he wrote a book on the history of American stand-up comedy. <clears throat> he mentioned how in the early days of radio, the comics could not deal when they were just by themselves doing shtick, they had to have a studio audience because they had no idea how to tell these jokes if there weren't people Absolutely. responding to them. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look what happened. I mean, um, where where story was was super local and um, and and very communal. Now you had um, fewer and fewer people telling stories, who in, in, when and and the storytellers were the consolidators of power. Um, and, um, and the dialogue ended. So, so now you have broadcast where uh, the only choice you really have is whether to tune in or tune out. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, by the late 20th century, uh, that, was, that was pretty ironclad. Um, our perceptions of the world were guided by um, the storytelling of an elite few, um, the the internet, um, and this has caught a lot of um, big uh, corporations and governments by surprise, um, is um, is reverting us to this kind of communal uh, narrative. Now, if somebody um, uh, takes a, a pharmaceutical company, um, starts charging, you know, forty times more uh, for yeah. a product. Than, than they did a week ago, there can be such incredible outrage uh, about it 
that um, that the pharmaceutical company is forced to to alter its plan, right. and that is an incredible and unprecedented um, shift in power. Um, we have all become storytellers. We're all famous for um, 150 people <laughs> um, or a thousand people. Yeah, I haven't checked out your Twitter following yet. So eight thousand not... people. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> Nine thousand. <laughs> um, uh, I got verified, so it's climbing cool. real fast. Cool. <laughs> that was when I when I interviewed Scott McCloud. I told him, you know, you do have the biggest Twitter following. Is Gil? That has to be bots. There's no way I have that many people who actually want to read what I'm saying. I'm like, yeah, chances are that's that's part of it. But you know. uh, but again, storytelling now in, in the internet era, we become more. We become the, a part of the story. So yeah. the, so so story needs to be redefined in a way as as not just um, the story being told, but the story being told um, uh, back to the storyteller and the story being told around. Um, uh, the, that dialogue. Um, so um, it, it's it's now a true conversation where we're all gathered around uh, the the flame again, hollering from the background. And and once in a while, when there are enough of us, um, uh, uh, kind of talking back to the storyteller all at once, the story can change, and um, and that is uh, uh, amazing. Um, so so when when you um, uh, have that in transmedia storytelling, um, it behooves um, the 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 owner of the brand or the entertainment content or, or the the message to listen. Um, uh, if you don't listen, your audience can go away and and go and 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 hang out with somebody who will listen, and and that's really really potent. How'd you get started in? story um i grew up in um in a kind of hostile world um uh, the um uh, lower east side in new york city in the 1960s was uh, was a tough uh, place and i was a sensitive kind of guy mm -hmm. <laughs> um and um and so um uh, story was my salvation um uh, story was um i i just didn't want to be there um, I needed to get out somehow, and um, and I was powerless to to kind of get out myself. So um, uh, I, I became fascinated with dinosaurs and Godzilla and fairy tales and myths, and um, uh, that led me um, uh, into um, uh, I, I, I it, the story would always be over too soon. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I started to love super long form storytelling because I got to stay there longer. So epic fantasy or um, epic poetry uh, was was fascinating. The bodies of work of Shakespeare or, or um, uh, Carl Jung or, or you know the, these uh, these these worlds and symbols and icons um, and and um, and figuring out. Um, uh, how these things have meaning for so many different people. Look, I saw a lot of violence in the streets. Why did everybody get along in the movie theater? <laughs> these were people who would ordinarily be killing yeah, each other. Each other. <laughs> um, and, um, and yet um, uh, they were all cheering um, uh, with the movie. I knew somehow there was an answer uh, in it. And, and so... Um, after a while, instead of simply uh, uh, subjectively enjo enjoying story, I wanted to proactively study story. Um, uh, again, um, I, I kind of couldn't understand and yet envied how some of my friends would take apart car engines. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there a car engine uh, to story? And the answer is yes. Yes, there are um, a, a kind of mechanisms within uh, storytelling, and um, and uh, I discovered Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, and was fascinated by those mechanisms. But I still wanted to delve further, um, and I began to make a few of my own uh, discoveries, especially as they were impacted by the technology that I was fascinated by, and that 
it, it yielded this kind of practical transmedia storytelling technique. Mm -hmm. And how do you get from, well, the, the, we'll say the canonical one, uh, the Atari video game of E.T. to <laughs> something that actually expands the, the universe of a, a, of IP, of a character of a universe? Um, you know, how did you start to find that ability to, to expand rather than simply, you know, plug in a character? Um, uh, a and big, you weren't you weren't involved in the ET video game. I right? was not. <laughs> <laughs> I just played it. <laughs> of course, <laughs> one of the few. <laughs> one of the few. Um, you know, um, uh, again, there was something about my persona that refused to to kind of curl up and hide um, in in my fantasy world. Um, uh, I, I saw the ease with which um, my neighbors, the, the, the dudes at school, would interact with people. And I wanted that uh, uh, for myself. I didn't want to be alone. Um, and, um, and I finally figured out that I could use storytelling to make connections. Uh, I used um, a, a game, actually, a tabletop game called Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, to, to uh, force myself to connect with with people and get them to play with me, yeah. <laughs> and um, and the desperation required to to keep them sitting at the table forced me to create stories that weren't just kind of compelling medieval fantasy adventures, but were kind of amalgams of of fantasy and the psyche of the people that I was that I was playing with. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, uh, if, if I knew something about your life, I would take those elements and, and put them in the story, um, so that you could recognize them so that you could pursue your aspirations in addition to your, your fantasy life in my game. And wow, that created this incredible bond. They kept coming back and more and more people wanted to, to play. Um, uh, as, um, as, uh, you know, I saw the, uh, rise of video games, um, I said, oh, here's a chance to, to do that in using video game technology and get people super involved in the story. I would be disappointed. <laughs> the technology wasn't nearly sure. there mm -hmm. and still isn't in, in many ways. Um, but, um, uh, through, uh, some some clever um, career maneuvers. Um, I, I got a um, an internship at a comic book company, which I knew was going to be purchased by a video game company, and and um, and I, I wriggled my way through um, and became this kind of uh, uh, keeper of the canon, keeper of the the superheroes and and monsters and things like that of the comic book world. Uh, so that the video game company would listen to me. And um, and because I was adept at understanding how technology can convey story, uh, I began to contribute ideas that were actually quite welcome. And I became a video game producer. Go figure. <laughs> were you a Marvel Handbook of the Universe guy also? Were, were you the sort who, you know, again, wanted to organize all that stuff when you were reading comics as a kid? Anything that broke down and categorized my favorite universes was was my thing <laughs> I, I can't imagine why a mutual friend thought you and i should get together and talk. <laughs> so there was the tolkien companion and the marvel handbook uh, of the the handbook of the marvel universe and um and the concordance of fantasy maps yeah. so i had oz and wonderland and narnia and could study everything oh of course yeah <laughs> yeah how um how important is that aspect, particularly for uh, a fantasy world, that idea of, of having an entire, uh, literally a map of the, the, the world laid out? Um, it, because that, it seems to be a recurring theme throughout fantasy, especially. Um, are we living in the, the triumph of the nerds? Is that really you hey, know, where we are? Uh, I know plenty of tough guys who used to use maps. Yeah, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> maps make it real. <clears throat> okay. So... 
the the distinction between a sports nerd who watches sports on television and listens to people talk about it on the radio and reads about it in the newspaper and might even be interested in the personal lives of the players, um, which are in the gossip columns. That's kind of nerdy to me. (laughs) So so if I want to make my uh, uh, fantasy world realistic, I'm just going to copy the sports nerd thing, aren't I? I'm going to make these characters have lives and, and, um, and have places to go and have pasts and have futures. And, um, and when you do that, it, it, we call it verisimilitude. It becomes real. Is there a character or IP that you've, you've created? <laughs> Anything you... Uh... Um, that, uh, those are like the big triumphs of, of my little career. Um, things you've sneaked um, in or, sure. well, or no, uh, standalone, um, uh... um, uh, a big hunk of the, uh, universe of magic, the gathering, the trading mm-hmm. card game, uh, comes from my Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> campaign. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> um, I, I had the idea of expanding, um, this super popular nineties, uh, trading card game into comics and games and got permission from my company to go and get that license. And, um, and they agreed and, um, and allowed me to help them kind of supercharge, uh, uh, their story worlds by connecting all those cards into, um, a, a persistent, uh, fiction. And, um, and then I wrote, uh, comic books that um, uh, brought these c- uh, characters to life, but also introduced a whole slew of my own uh, characters. Did you get revenge on people mythology. you used to know in, in school or anything? Well, <laughs> there were yeah, there a, couple of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of uh, uh, teen crushes whose uh, the girls' names would, would show up yeah. in the uh, <laughs> in the in, in the storyline. There was a. Um, uh, the Hot Wheels animation had a, a, a character who, uh, whose name was uh, a, a girl I really liked, and and she she wrote me an email and said, "Hey, what's that?" And of course, uh, I was in all my glory. <laughs> oh, no, it's a total coincidence, honey. I have Complete. no idea. <laughs> Is there a um, an old property you wish you could uh, expand transmedia oh. eyes? Of course, of course. Um, Is there one you focus on particularly as opposed well, to I, you know, I, a um, hit list? Because um, I've got The Prisoner in mind as, as sort of an archetypal prisoner, one. But, and that, that is a, a fantastic one. Why? Because um, um, you have the mythos of, of the prisoner's island where he has to get out. And so that has all this kind of mysterious past and and uh, uh, hundreds of questions that are unanswered in that wonderful series, The Prisoner. But you also have the backstory of The Prisoner himself, which was alluded to in another TV series uh, that people don't know as much about. Um, uh, so that that's really cool. I'd love to do that. But um, um, for, for pure cheese, uh, the Irwin Allen uh, TV shows were awesome. Yeah. Uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Time Tunnel, Land of the Giants, um, <laughs> and uh, Lost in Space. Could you imagine somehow combining those into a single uh, wild story world the way that, that Marvel does with Doctor Strange and Spider-Man and Iron Man? Um, I, I think it would be awesome. Supposedly, Key and Peel if they kept the show going, were planning to bring almost every single skit they had into the same universe because they, they constructed it along those lines that theoretically, even the post-apocalyptic couple of skits they did could follow from the, the, the same universe. Nerds! <laughs> <laughs> and they reveled in it. It was, it was fine. Sure. Um, talk about slash fiction and how... Uh, I went to college in the very late 80s, early 90s, and it was already um, a genre and one that the... Uh, the IP holders were not happy about um, when there was Kirk, uh, Kirk Spock slash fiction that sure. was Paramount was really unhappy Kirk that this sort of Spock thing was loved being each a... other very much in yeah. that uh, fan fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How does that play into the evolution of, of again, what you do now? It's actually um, uh, I- intrinsic. I mean, slash fiction being a subset of fan fiction. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should so, have just gone with fan so, fiction yeah, overall. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's wonderful because um, uh, fan fiction, you you have to understand entropy and and the fact that that 
um, being creative burns an enormous amount of energy. You have to really concentrate to finish a story um, and, um, and to finish a series of stories and to, to go through the um, uh, trouble of sharing those stories. That's also a lot of, of uh, creative and physical energy. So to me, uh, all the way back then in, in the 70s and 80s, where, where this kind of uh, fiction really kind of came into its own because people began to collect it and staple it in, in little yeah. magazines and trade it with each other. Um, that was um, a, an expression. I saw it as an expression of adoration for uh, the intellectual property. You loved Star Trek. If you're writing erotica with Kirk and Spock. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because it, that, that content troubled uh, the intellectual property owners. They, they felt, of course, that their copyrights were being violated. And in some cases, fans were uh, uh, prosecuted. Um, um, uh, uh, Paramount was particularly yeah. um, uh, aggressive about this. And, um, uh, and that, um, uh, when, when the internet came, of course... Um, that kind of fiction proliferated because now it's so easy to to share that stuff. And um, uh, when um, when Paramount went after those people, they they experienced something they'd never experienced before, which was backlash. Um, uh, here you had fans pushing back and complaining uh, about it, and they saw that they were tarnishing their own brand by attempting to quell uh, fan fiction. So. Um, um, uh, they let it go, and um, and fan fiction became uh, all kinds of of uh, fantastic expressions of fan love for for uh, these story worlds, films, uh, uh, fan films, and um, um, uh, 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 YouTube videos uh, with critiques and discussions of the minutia of these worlds. Um, so. Think about it right now. Um, a, uh, a a Darth Vader comic book from Marvel might sell sixty or seventy thousand copies. That's so tiny as almost to be non-existent mm -hmm. to to um, Lucasfilm and Disney. Who cares about seventy thousand people? We need millions and millions and millions of people to make money. But what happens is that if something canonical, if something important happens in that Darth Vader comic, there's going to be hundreds of fans talking about it on YouTube, which is going to yield thousands of hours of content, which is going to attract millions of people. You see, so it is worth it um, for, for Disney to to put out that comic book because it is keeping... Uh, uh, Star Wars in the zeitgeist. It is keeping the flame uh, burning. Now we're getting into business. Now we're getting into the fact that this isn't just about being a nerd. This is about making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You gotten attacked by fans for decisions you've made? <laughs> generally <laughs> do they not know that you're you're the guy making certain generally decisions? we're in the background okay <laughs> i was wondering if there's ever been an instance we're, where that son of a <laughs> we're we're well hidden um uh, uh but uh where where we have been a little more uh, uh up front like like with magic the gathering of course there were fans uh yeah. there are fans who argue about my work in in 1995 96 today um <laughs> online Which, are, it's, I, I, it's just a couple of hundred but, but they're, still, they're there you should take that as a compliment oh, I, I do uh, it's a lot better than being yeah, ignored it bruises the ego a little bit but um yeah. but, it, but they it, care uh, they care enough they care. to, to yes. tear you down into little pieces <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly is there an art form a storytelling form before superhero comics that involved serial characters going on for decades and decades Decades and decades? Because I can't think of anything. Uh, I was trying to think about it recently, about why superhero comics can get tiresome, burned out, repetitive, etc. And I realized, going back to Homer and then the Greek tragedians, you know, they've picked up the same characters and told stories with them. They weren't telling them serially for 
years and years and years the way 50 plus years has had to we've had spider-man fantastic four etc i i actually think that that that's a little uh, uh debatable um uh the um um, the, these were epic cycles, yeah. th- those ancient myths. Um, uh, and w- we, we don't have to limit it to um, uh, Greek and Roman mythology. This is across Certainly. Um, every, uh, every the culture. Middle East, North Africa, yeah. um, uh, China. Um, so, um, uh, yes, after uh, a couple of centuries, um, uh, we understood where Hercules was born and where he was when he died. Um, but that is a long uh, life that dovetails with the lives of, of dozens and dozens of other uh, uh, characters, mythic uh, uh, beings, monsters, and things like that. And, um, and so that cycle uh, was uh, elongated. It, it was shortened, depending on who was telling the, the story. And... Um, and and that went on for years and years and years, decades and and, and decades. They they um you can only call it a complete work in that we can track the 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 everything from creation to to the Armageddon of of these uh, uh, characters, um, uh, but the richness of it. Uh, makes it last a, a, a super long time. If you want to get a little more uh, a contemporary, in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century, these pulp characters um, uh, did persist for years and years and years. And um, and although there wasn't as structured a um, an arc for them, um, uh, the 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 Lone Ranger, you, you know. Um, yeah was born and 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 died there was a final story or even sherlock holmes um and um and there were uh, any number hundreds or thousands of of narratives that could be selected uh in, in between if you want to go to the movies um uh, think about uh the universal monsters um which started in the uh uh mid 1940s almost like a reaction to uh uh the the various wars or maybe even earlier uh, dracula i think was was super early um but they began to visit each other's movies so so and of course abbott and costello uh, well they they <laughs> they finished it up didn't they <laughs> um it, it got baroque by the end of that arc which which was you know 10 or 15 years after the the introduction mm-hmm. of those first uh, uh movies and uh, and once you start joking uh, with the monsters, um, yeah. it, you're you're uh, you're wrapping it up. Um, uh, so I, I do think that there's some precedent for it. A lot of people ignore um, uh, Japanese popular culture. True. In um, in post World War II Japan, um, there were a number of uh, social and economic uh, edicts uh, that required companies to share. Uh, their intellectual property. Um, even if you are a competitor of mine, I have to hand over this property because it could stimulate the economy. And um, and so um, uh, entertainment uh, uh, concepts um, uh, moved very quickly from one media platform to the next and yielded these fabulous, rich universes, particularly because they celebrated the the creator, the storyteller. So the storyteller could travel from the newspaper to the uh, book publisher, to the uh, television network, to the movie uh, uh, studio, and, um, and and help to generate the stories based on their uh, uh, fantasy and, and science fiction characters. And so we got these super rich, elaborate um, uh, uh, fictional story worlds um, that were powerful influences on people like uh, George Lucas and uh, um, uh, Joss Whedon and J.J. Abrams. Cool. Were you a Marvel or a DC kid when you were young? <laughs> because it really was one or the other. I mean, it, you might, you might really flirt was. a little bit, but, you know. Um, it, um, it, it was Marvel that was, was compelling. Marvel... They had, had the universe. Well, I lived in New York, True. So so when Peter Parker um uh swung by these um uh 
uh, water towers on the top of the buildings um, or, or showed up in Rockefeller Center or, or swung around a projects building. I was like, ah, he's here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, were there particular, were you a Spider-Man kid primarily or were there other other comics that um, really characterize your youth? I, I loved uh, Spider-Man. Um, I, I, uh, I loved Doctor Strange because of the, uh, the, mm-hmm. the whole metaphysical thing. Um, uh, uh, oddly, the the angst of Silver Surfer <laughs> that, that hit a lot of people. The the, the Bushima um, days for that. Yeah, yeah that that really <laughs> the Bushima days. Wow, you're 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 revealing yourself. Oh, you, you, before my time, but I, I read all <laughs> oh, those. Before your time, we used to when I was a kid, uh, we'd go to ham radio flea markets with my old man, and there was a guy there who'd be selling ripped up, uh, you know, uh, coverless Silver Age comics. Uh, so we were picking up stuff from the the 60s before I was born. I was born in 71. So we were getting stuff from the 60s, mm-hmm. old issues of the X-Men, um, those old Silver Surfers, uh, Submariner, things like that. And it was just, you know, blowing our minds when I was five or six years old. My there brother's a couple years older. There you go. Oh, and by the way, uh, I was into ham radio, too. Yeah. Um, I didn't have my own setup, but there was um, uh, someone that my my grandma would would take me to. A way out in Queens, <laughs> and he had a ham radio, and um, and that was the first time that I experienced the power of making um, th- these kinds of anonymous connections across uh, many miles. Um, whoever was out there was a rarity, so so if they heard you, they responded and enjoyed the the connection, which didn't happen to me too often <laughs> in yeah. real life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the ham radio, then the CB radio, these were expressions to me of our yearning um, mm. uh, to make um, intimate connections uh, across uh, time and space, and um, and it really I feel laid the groundwork for. Um, uh, the DARPA net and, and the internet, which, um, which came a little later. Yeah. Were you a science fiction kid in the eighties kind of waiting for this stuff to happen? Uh, you know, William Gibson sort of thing or, or, you know, I would draw, uh, uh pictures. I, I, I would, um, I would think how long will it take for us to get a communicator <laughs> from Star Trek? Um, in, in our hands what would that be like here on earth if we all were walking around with communicators yeah now we know unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> we'd all just smash into stuff into and be streets, you know yeah. texting while driving <laughs> are you jealous of kids for all the the a for the superhero stuff that we could barely find when we were kids uh but b just the sheer amount of of you know consumable stuff that we just didn't know dude i'm still a kid if you look around <laughs> in my house it's it's i i have not grown up um <clears throat> no actually um i i find myself defending them um you know and uh, it, it's a little disappointing um but not unexpected a, a new medium is uh is is rising and um and i've seen this happen a few times so um, I know that before my time, with the rise of television, it was going to be the destroyer of worlds. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, children's brains would melt. It would just be the end. Um, then uh, uh, video games were going to kill us all. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it was going to turn us into savages. Uh, and, um, and, um, and then the Internet itself. Um, which of course was going to corrupt our minds and, and get us all molested. And, um, and now if we try um, hard, but go on, yeah. <laughs> mobile phones, um, and, um, and the disdain I see, um, uh, adults, uh, have toward, toward a child's working with a mobile phone is, is, uh, is disappointing because here these kids from my perspective have, um, uh, the incarnation of knowledge abundance windows into the sum total of human knowledge in their pocket. Um, and I- instead of putting all our resources uh, to teaching them how, how uh, to utilize that information or access that information, as well as to socially um, uh, uh, take advantage of, of this and present ourselves uh, artfully uh, through it. I- instead, we have um, put that thing away. 
or or um, uh, you know, uh, or, or they're making fun by uh, adults uh, are, are swinging their thumbs over a, mocking a, them a over. phone, mocking them, and um, and it, it's disappointing. Um, we um, we're going to learn uh, so much in the next uh, few years about the impact. Uh, that these devices have on on the newest generation of of kids, kids born after the advent of the internet in the late nineties. Um, I think it's profound, and I think it's untapped. Yeah. Same question I asked Virginia Heffernan last week. The first app you just didn't get that you were just like, I don't understand why this is here, and I can't make this work. You know, because for me, Twitter was one of those like. I'm not, it took me a while to finally get it, but for the first couple of months I was staring at it like, I don't, I don't get what you do with this. Have you had that? Yeah. Well, I, I've been a, a critic of, of Twitter yeah. um, and, and, and felt that there were uh, problems in its interface and, and sure. design, um, but, but you, I understood it I, yeah. and used it. Um, Snapchat. Uh, you too? Okay, because that was, that was Virginia's leap, thing too. She a was, big leap. She just couldn't. Um, but I can't, you know... Uh, uh, my team at Starlight Runner, um, if if we find ourselves not liking something that has caught on, yeah. we have to stop ourselves. We can't be the guy that says, get off my lawn. Oh, yeah. Extrapolating from your own experience is a disaster. That's, <laughs> you have to assume the market knows what it's doing, you know. So so with with Snapchat, it, it's so fascinating. Um, uh, my daughter essentially answered the, the question. Um, uh, I, I get to uh, express myself authentically uh, to people I care about. Mm -hmm. All right. So Snapchat is for people you, you genuinely care enough about to show them the mundane aspects of your uh, life, your, your everyday existence that is not spoiled by the need for immediacy by the need for right this 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 second so so snapchat um uh transcends time <laughs> um I, I get to be intimate with you but time uh, doesn't necessarily impact that in intimacy it's really fascinating and and so i'm i'm like okay i may not use it my actually i'm yeah. banned by my my daughter uh <laughs> from using it but um <laughs> but i understand it and and appreciate how powerful it is hmm. Where's it all going? Ooh. This is the big one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you get to pontificate or or project. However, you're going to. Uh, where is the storytelling going? What what piece of technology would make it you know that much better? Mm. Um, uh, I'm believe it or not, even though I'm from New York, I'm an <laughs> optimist. I'm, I'm I'm so excited uh, because. Um, um, I think that um, uh, that we are starting to see some amazing things uh, unfold, and we have to appreciate them. Um, uh, for I, I, I keep doing this, but for thousands and thousands of years, we have been running on a very specific um, notion of story, um, and. Um, and and by the way, Joseph Campbell didn't invent the hero's journey. He just documented the hero's journey. What is the hero's journey? It's um, it's something that dates back to the time where we were holed up in caves. Um, we were huddled together, and if one of us didn't go out and get the food, or or get the fire, or get other people, we, we'd be dead. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so. The hero, the, 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 the person who, who went out, the hunter, what have you, uh, risked their life and overcame uh, incredible dangers, usually through direct confrontation, um, battle, uh, and, and um, acquired, either died, in which case that's not a happy ending, yeah. but, but acquired the boon and brought it back. Okay, so there was a circular uh, a kind of uh, mythic journey that that occurred um that um that was celebrated because it was good <laughs> it caused yeah. us to live <laughs> um so so that th that person became uh what we now call hero uh, a heroic uh, uh person and um and we depended on that person's uh actions okay 
Um, so generally, you would call that pretty masculine. Um, a pretty direct, um, pretty uh, uh, combat oriented. There was violence in the hero's journey. Um, and uh, our brains became hardwired. It, it just was repeated so many times and coded into every story told um, uh, around the world and across time that we became hardwired to appreciate and kind of get off on it. We were excited by the the hero's journey, the mentor, the um, uh, the, the um, uh, belly of the beast, all, all these kind of of mythic steps that you take to to um, defeat the enemy. And there was always an enemy, even if the um, situation was institutional or systemic. Um, the hero's journey forced us to incarnate um, uh, all of that into a single person who can be destroyed by the hero. Um, and then we came home and, and gave our, our community the boon, the, the 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 thing that they needed to survive. So. Um, um, I I was never a hundred percent comfortable with with the hero's journey because I saw violence. I understood mm -hmm. violence. Um, the young people uh, around me were struck. Um, uh, were were um, uh, um, uh, of a mentality for violence. Uh, some of their lives ended because of violence and um, uh, and. Uh, uh, physical, uh, psychological, sexual violence. It, it's just something that made me really uncomfortable. And, and, um, and I always had wondered, is there a way um, to tell a story that doesn't necessitate that kind of, of uh, confrontation? Can we be excited by something other than this linear um, uh, kind of masculine uh, uh, notion. And, um, and th when I started to see, um, uh, these, these movements, these kind of spontaneous, uh, communications because of social media, where, um, uh, somebody could climb a pole and pull down the Confederate flag. <clears throat> um, and that's not a meme. That's not something that, that is uh, uh, copied and replicated across the internet. That is the culmination of a collective um, realization about our society that demands some kind of change that is imminent, that is immediate, and that can be symbolized by that woman climbing that pole and taking that flag down. That's a, a collective narrative. That's the collective journey um, that, that we're taking. And not many people had to get hurt uh, in order for that to, to happen, for, for all these companies to change their mind, for Walmart to stop selling the Confederate flag. That's a sacrifice that they made, um, but they did it. And, and that is really fascinating to me. That's the power of the consumer. That is... Um, uh, um, a, a journey that, that certain people are, are taking that, that can be quite uh, breathtaking and, and dramatic without necessarily um, uh, uh, celebrating a single individual and, and um, uh, putting them on some kind of pedestal and having us need that person in order to survive. And you think that's going to play out in uh, it, it's, in, it's, in the way it's art is developing? It's yeah. it's playing out. Look at what we're enjoying these days: um, uh, the Walking Dead, um, mm -hmm. the uh, um, Game of Thrones, um, Orange is the New Black. These are collective journey narratives. They're they're everything we nerds love. They're huge, sprawling yeah. universes where anyone can die, where, where um, uh, the, the system isn't necessarily incarnated by one uh, awful individual. There are lots of awful yeah. individuals, but also <laughs> lots of halfway decent people. Um, um, everybody impacts everybody else when, when, uh, when these events unfold. Um, uh, these are um, uh, collective uh, uh, journeys that we're, we're starting to see. Uh, manifest in our popular culture. So novelizations of 
Star Wars movies really, you know, we, we've really transcended all that as, as far as, you know, what we're doing. <laughs> Uh, you've got to to have uh, transmedia for anything that's that's going to uh, cost you a lot of money because you've got to yeah. make money and and you have to engage your fans and talk to them mm-hmm. and and uh, enjoy the content with them uh, yeah. in, in order for this to to really um, um, uh, catch on. Um, uh, look at. Um, Look at what happened with Ghostbusters. Um, he, here was um, uh, uh, what should have been a step forward um, for the the franchise. Uh, these these female characters and, and so forth. It, it it created the standard kind of resentment in, among the fan community because they don't like change, and you're you're making four guys into four girls. Um, and uh, instead of um, uh, working to get people to appreciate um, what this was and the new universe that was going to manifest out of it, um, the, the studio and, and the creatives started fighting with, with this tiny uh, group of people and, and behaving negatively toward them. Well, they're stupid um, and, and that, that sort of thing. And it created this bad taste that impacted, I feel, the box office. Yeah. It is one of the few movies I've gone out to see in the theater, partly just out of solidarity. Once this whole <laughs> crazy conflict was going on, I'm like they, they deserve fifteen bucks from for me and my wife to, you know. Sure. But yeah, I can understand how that that macro micro uh, involvement with these things can really submarine. It, it, some, uh, it, it some could. Properties. The, the movie itself could have been better. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, felt it, I felt it was serviceable. You know, it, it, it accomplished what it did. It, the action sequences, eh, it not could so have much. Been, uh, uh, so much more if the action sequences and the the um, uh, the narrative were informed by uh, a, a kind of logic system um, that acknowledged the past, perhaps even tied in the earlier uh, yeah. uh, pictures somehow, and. Um, um, and and took itself seriously, um, uh, your, the the fan the 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 nerds would have rallied uh, uh, to its side, and uh, and kept that fire uh, burning, much like the original uh, picture did. If you think back at, at their explanations for what's going on and and the mythos behind what was going on, there, it actually holds together. Yeah. The original Ghostbusters, not so much uh, uh, this one, and and so it, it, you can't you can't lose both battles. <laughs> you won't do well. Understood. Now my last question: Champions or villains and vigilantes? Oh man! <laughs> I gotta say, um, I I played a character. <laughs> named Dark Shaft Silver Rod <laughs> in Champions. <laughs> Understood. And and he was uh he he played both sides. <laughs> <laughs> he was a hero and a villain. <laughs> As it were. Very nice. <laughs> Jeff Gomez, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memory Show. Thanks so much for having me. And that was Jeff Gomez. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting starlightrunner.com. And that's S-T-A-R-L-I-G-H-T-R-U-N-N-E-R.com. He's also on Twitter at Jeff underscore Gomez, and Gomez is G-O-M-E-Z. Uh, now, this trip involved a drive down to the Jersey Shore, but not the the GTL Jersey Shore, you know, a little bit away from that stuff. Um, but there were some tolls on the parkway, uh, as well as just running up lots of miles. Uh, parking was free, so that worked out nice. Um, there are a couple of Dunkin' Donuts stops for, for cold brew coffee also. Anyway, if you want to help defray some of my costs, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation through either of those. 
I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show. Uh, it's not exactly transmedia storytelling, but it is kind of neat to have some of the um, some of the written stuff that goes along with this. Uh, so you can get the bonus podcast, uh, patron only blog. I would like to launch a series of eBooks related to the the show and more. So go to patreon.com slash VMS pod and support the art of fine conversation. And if you don't like Patreon, just go to paypal.me slash VMS pod and make a donation that way. If you do, you'll get access to the same material through fear of a square planet.com. A special thanks go out to our supporters, Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, and Ron Slate, who have gone over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David. And you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual memory Show. Thanks so much for listening. I'm hoping to have the author and cultural critic Sven Burkertz on next week, but that's going to involve a lot of moving parts. Um, if he is the next guest, and it's a really neat triumvirate of shows from Virginia Heffernan to Jeff to uh, to Sven, because he um, he has a lot of issues with the pervasiveness of technology in, in our day and age. So I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to record this week and that that'll be next week's show. But it's possible next week's guest will instead be the theological scholar David M. Carr. You'll have to come back and find out. Until then, you can subscribe to the show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr. Dot com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm-hmm.